Hello, my name is Pastor Freddy Reynosa, and I am the senior pastor at the Stoner Memorial Seventh-day Adventist Church on Nobility Hill in Stoner, Massachusetts. Our church has been serving the greater Boston area for over a hundred years through ministry, education, and community service. You can find out more about us at our website, stonamemorial.org, or visiting us in person at 29 Maple Street. We thank you for joining us here at our weekly church service. We want to welcome you to our church. We are so happy that um, we're here together to worship God. And uh, um, we have uh, uh, some announcements today. One is that uh, I'm sure that um, some of you didn't see me for a couple of Sabbaths. I was on vacations and I'm back. I think that's, <laughs> that's good, um, right? I would like to pray at this time. Uh, before I pray, for those of you who are not following Christy, Pastor Christy online, she arrived yesterday to Florida, so she's already settled in her uh, new place. And we continue to pray for her that God will use her the same way that she used her here. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we want to thank you for this beautiful Sabbath that you give us for the opportunity, Lord, that you give us to worship you. And Father, as we are here this morning, we ask, Lord, that you can pour out your Holy Spirit on each one of us, that we will have a, a good experience knowing that you love us, that you care for us, and that you have a plan for our lives. Father, we ask that you can be with those who are not doing well, who are maybe at hospitals or not feeling well, Lord, that, uh, that you can put your healing hand on them. And that you give them the assurance that they are not alone. Be with us also, Father, as we worship you this morning. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. That leads us to our opening hymn of 448. Oh, when shall I see Jesus? 448. I encourage you to use your hymnals. I know the words are up there, but if you read notes or want to sing harmony, please do that.
Dear Lord, join us as we worship. I pray, amen. Good morning, happy Sabbath. Today I'll be reading to you a story and its title is, I'm Not Ashamed. Does anybody here know what ashamed means? Uh, what does it mean? Yeah, it's true. Okay, today's lesson uh, or story is called I'm Not Ashamed. Lawrence lives in the hills outside of the capital city of Burundi, which is a country in East Central Africa. Ever since he can remember, his parents have taught the children to pray and use their talents for God. How many of you have talents? All of you should raise your hands because God has blessed you with a talent even if you don't know what it is yet. Lawrence and his older sister enjoy singing to church, and sometimes they go with their father to visit neighbors and tell them that God loves them, and God loves each of you too. Some people thank them for coming, but others don't want to hear about God. But Lawrence has decided it's very important to tell people about Jesus, even if they don't accept him as their savior. Lawrence shares his faith with his classmates and invites them to church. Today I brought three friends with me to church, he says. Other times, other boys come with me. Lawrence's parents worship in a church close to home, but Lawrence liked the church in the center of the town. So he and his friends walk 45 minutes to church, but the boys don't mind the long walk. Some of my th friends think it's strange that we worship on Sabbath instead of the Sunday. Lauren says, so while we're walking, I can explain why we do things differently from other churches. I tell them that what I think Jesus wants them to know. Then on the way home, we talk about what we learned in church that day. One of Lauren's friends attends church with him and has joined the children's choir, but his parents weren't happy that he was going to church on Sabbath. They told him that if he kept going to church with Lawrence, he would have to find another place to live. So the boy went to stay with Lawrence's family for two weeks. Then one day, his parents told him to come back home and promised that he could attend church. Lawrence's friend loves Jesus and doesn't want anything or anyone to stop him from worshiping on the Sabbath. Several Adventist children attend the school with Lawrence. Soon they'll take the national exams to determine who can go to seventh grade next year. How many of you are in seventh grade? Sixth grade? Fifth grade? Nice. The teachers hold special classes on Saturdays to help students prepare for the exam. The children tell the teachers that it's more important to worship God than to go to school. School is important and education is very important. You should work hard on your studies, but remember that God should always be your number one priority. Although the teachers and principal could make it difficult for the students who skip classes on Sabbath, the children praise God that so far the teachers understand and allow them to miss the classes. Sometimes their friends ask them, why don't you come to school on Saturday? You can go to church after classes. Lawrence tries to explain the importance of obeying God's laws. And what is one of God's commandments? The fourth one, specifically. Yes. Yeah, and these children, um, a lot of them don't know, but Lawrence and his friends are spreading the word that God says to worship on the Sabbath, and so they're keeping the Sabbath. I am not ashamed to share my faith, Lawrence says. I will tell my friends about God, even when they laugh at me. Lawrence is a missionary. We can be missionaries too, as well as we, if we tell our friends that we love Jesus and invite them to worship God with us. Will you be a missionary this week? and be, not be ashamed to share God's word. Yes? Oh, yeah, it is a question. I'm asking if you will be a missionary this week and not be ashamed to share God's word. Raise your hand if you're gonna be a missionary this week. Nice. Does anybody want to have a closing prayer? Okay.
Thank you, Jesus, for this day, and thank you for the Sabbath that you have made for us. And please help us so we can be work for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. Happy Sabbath. Um, it's um, local church budget reading for today. Um, one day, a fisherman was fishing at the edge of a lake when a gray herring landed next to him. The bird looked into his bucket and saw a fish. When the bird tried to take the fish from the bucket, the fisherman tapped him with the end of his rod and made a deal with him. Every other fish I will give to you under condition that you don't steal. The fisherman named bird Henry. So the fisherman caught on a fish and tossed into, into it to Henry. The, the next catch went into the bucket. Henry waited for his turn. In an hour, he must have eaten at least 10 to 12 fish. Then he flew away. Each time the fisherman returned to that lake, Henry would fly and land next to him. The fisherman didn't have financial resources to give to the local churches. But he wanted to contribute to the ministers of the church. He donated the fish in the bucket to the new immigrant people who were attending his, this church. The fisherman questioned if this ministry was a way of working for God since he had limited resources. Henry was God's answer to him. In the Bible, God uses animals to touch our lives. And it shall be that thou shalt drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed thee there. 1 Kings 17 verse 4. Giving can also come in many forms, like time, talent, or tender. Let us pray. Dear Lord, please be with the tithes and offerings given today. May they be used fruitfully and for your glory. In your name we pray, amen. Sabbath. Scripture is found in 2 Peter 1, 12. Therefore, I intend to keep on reminding you about these things, even though you already know them and are firmly established in the truth that you now have. How great it is to be able to bring our worries, our troubles, and our situations to Christ through prayer. It is time for prayer, and I would encourage you this morning as I pray that you bring your troubles and your situations to the altar, to God, to his throne. Those, I'd like to invite those who can uh, to accompany me in uh, praying by kneeling or just bowing your heads. Our dear, most precious and loving Father, we are thankful that you've allowed us to be here in church this morning. We know that your presence is here and we're just happy that we're able to talk with you. And even though you know our situations and you know what's in our hearts, we're glad that we are able to verbalize them and bring them to you this morning. We ask that you bless us in a very special way as we uh, listen to the word. May we be blessed by it and that that word help us deepen our relationship with you today. I pray for Pastor, Pastor Freddy Reynosa that you give him your Holy Spirit, that you give him your message, and that uh, we can uh, eagerly listen and be ready to apply them uh, for our lives. We love you, Lord. We're thankful for the many 
uh, things that you do for us even though we don't deserve them. Particularly, we're grateful, thankful for that wonderful sacrifice that you made in the cross of Calvary. We did not deserve us that you took our place, and today we have a chance of being redeemed and things returning to the way they were in the beginning. We long for that beautiful day when you come back. Uh, we want to be with you for eternity. We want to be participants of that place where there'll be peace and harmony for eternity. We pray for those that uh, are not feeling well. We pray for each single member uh, that is here and the families represented here, every child, older person. And if there is something that is impeding from us, for us to be one with you, we ask that through the Holy Spirit, you bring us to you. We, by the way, are thankful for the patience that you have for us and your interest in trying to save us. Be with us, be with us here this morning. We ask for this blessing in the precious name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. faith will fail Christ will hold me fast when the tempter would prevail Christ will hold me fast I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path for my love is often cold Christ must hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast Christ will hold me fast, precious in his holy sight. He will hold me fast, he'll not let my soul be lost. His promises shall last, bought by him at such a cost. He will hold me fast He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast For my 
my life he bled and died Christ will hold me fast Justice has been satisfied He will hold me fast Raised with him to endless life He will hold me fast Till our faith is turned to sight He will come at last He will hold me fast He will hold me fast For my Savior loves me so He will hold me fast to even speak after the beautiful music. I just feel that we are blessed to be here. Um, Just the opening hymn reminding us (laughs) when that trumpet sound in the morning when we will see Jesus. I don't know if, (laughs) if you are touched by it the words of the special music also. But it is good to be in the presence of God. Something that I forgot, I think, is to announce our coming weekend, Revival Weekend, that Pastor Bill Brace is going to be here starting on Friday, Friday at 7, Pastor Bill Brace will be here, and um, he's going to speak also on Sabbath morning. He's going to have a presentation in the afternoon. And the title of the presentations that he's going to have is uh, The Bridegroom. So I'm looking forward to the gospel presentation that he's going to have here. Um, So I hope that you make plans to be here. During... um, this coming Sabbath that I'm going to be speaking here, uh, I'm going to be speaking uh, about our prophetic heritage because I believe it's important for us to understand who we are and why we are here. So it is important for us to understand that. So for the coming Sabbath, I'm going to be speaking about those important topics that we need to understand, we need to remember so that we don't forget, and that we will get excited and share the good news with others. I believe that we are living in interesting times, and God has called the Seventh-day Adventist Church for a special purpose and mission during this time. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, Lord, We want to hear your voice this morning. We ask, Lord, that you will speak to us. And that the message that you have for us, Lord, that we will be able to understand. But not just to have that in theory, in our minds. But that that truth will make a difference in our hearts and in our minds. That we will get excited about sharing this good news with others. And that we will prepare ourselves and prepare others for the soon return of Jesus Christ. So speak to us, Lord, this morning. It is in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. So with all the confusion in the Christian world going on during this time, is it possible to know, to be sure, that God has a special group of people 
that he has called during these times with a special message for the world. And I believe that it is important that we understand our message, that we understand our mission. The Apostle Peter, after he speaks about how we as Christians grow, that needs to take place in our lives, then he, he talks about something that it is important for us to understand. And I'm going to read it again. It's uh, 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. I am reading from the, from the New King James Version. This is what the Apostle Peter says. For this reason, I will not be negligent to remind you always of these things, though you know and are established in the present truth. Okay, so Peter is telling us that it is important for us to be established in present truth. Present truth, then, he contrasts that present truth as we continue reading in verse 16. He says, For we did not follow cunningly devised fables when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ to you, but were eyewitnesses of his majesty. For he received from God the Father honor and glory when such a voice came to him from that excellent glory, this is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Verse 18. And we heard this voice which came from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountains. And so, we have the prophetic word confirmed or certain in other versions, which you do well to hear as a light that shines in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star arises in your hearts. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of a scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. So the, the Apostle Peter is telling us that it is important to, start, to be established in present truth. And he distinguishes this present truth from fables, cunningly devised fables. So during Peter's time, the early church was established on present truth. And we as Adventists, uh, we talk a lot about present truth, but sometimes we don't explain what present truth is. So it is important for us to understand, right, that uh, there was present truth from, for Adam. They were present truth for Moses. And then... There is present truth for us. Present truth is truth that is revealed. Uh, for example, in, in the book of Daniel, we have uh, some parts of the book of Daniel that the angel, God, tell Daniel, you know, this portion of the book is still until the time of the end. Many will run to and fro in knowledge shall increase. Knowledge, knowledge will be increased, right? So, there were things in the book of Daniel that were not present truth for the time of Daniel, but they become present truth for us. That's why God is revealing those things to us. And the important understanding present truth is that once we understand present truth, we know our duty, right? Um, was the Sabbath present truth before in the early church? I don't think it was because every single Christian kept the seven-day Sabbath, right? But there is a time when it become a distinctive mark of the remnant church, right? I'm not saying that people didn't have to keep the Sabbath, but, you know, everyone did, right? So it becomes present truth for us. So Peter contrasts present truth with fables. 
but it also talks about, when, when he's talking here, he's also talking about that experience. Remember that experience in the Mount of Transfiguration that he had. When Jesus was transfigured, and they saw Jesus with his glory, and, and, and Moses and Elijah were there. And he says, and we were eyewitnesses of that. So what Peter is saying, present truth is also a personal experience. Because one thing is that we have this theory in our minds, right? We understand these things, and other thing is to have that experience. So that's why I believe it's important for us that we have what? This personal experience also. What is the prophetic truth according to Paul? We're going to look at 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, and we're going to start reading verse 2. Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to start reading in verse 2. This is what he says, the Apostle Paul. He talks about the coming of the Lord. And then he says, starting in verse 1, Second Thessalonians chapter 2, we're going to start reading in verse 1. Now, brethren, concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you not to be soon shaken in mind or trouble, either by a spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as though the day of the Lord had come. Verse 3. Let no one deceive you by any means, for that day will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worship, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Verse 5, do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Verse 7, and now you know what is restraining, that he may be revealed in his own time. Verse 7, for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work, only he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. And then verse 8, Then the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming. Very important then, uh, the Apostle Paul is telling us that there will be an apostasy before Jesus returns, right? He also talks about the appearance of a man of sin, or lawlessness in the church. This man of sin claims allegiance due to God. And he said that it was already at work in Paul's day. But there is a power that restrained him. So this power has been at work for more than 2,000 years. What am I saying this? Because it is important for us to understand, because we're talking about our heritage as Adventists. And not just as Adventists, but our heritage as reformers. Because some of the principles that we as Adventists have adopted, uh, we got those principles from the reformers. The way they study the Bible, the principles they apply, those are the ones that, that we're using. And that's why when we go to the Bible, sometimes it seems that we're reading two different Bibles, right? With the Christian world, a certain understanding of, of the mental sin and, and all of these things. And that's why I think it is important for us to understand this. And I hope that uh, at the end of the sermon, we will get an idea why is that there is so much confusion in this world. So um, then Jesus continues, right? In Matthew 24, he talks about the destruction of Jerusalem. Then he talks about the great period of tribulation. And this tribulation was going to last, remember, um, for 1260 years. To come to that conclusion, what Adventists use is the year-day principle. That this is not something that Adventists came up. 
the reformers used the year-day principle also. And, and what we call historicism. Historicism is the way that we as Seventh-day Adventists study the prophecies. What historicism means is that we start from the day or from the time of the prophet. And those prophecies end until the coming of Christ. We have Daniel 2, right? It starts with Babylon in the time of Daniel. And it ends with the coming of Christ. We also have Daniel 7. So because we understand the Bible this way, is that we have been able to, to understand some of these final events, and we are able to identify, number one, uh, the remnant that it was going to appear after this period of tribulation, right? The remnant was going to come out of a great tribulation. And also the men of sin of the Antichrist also, we are able to identify that. And let me tell you that all the reformers, or most of them, agree that the men of sin was the papacy. How do they come out to that conclusion? They follow the historicist method of interpretation. They apply the year-day principle that is in, um, in uh, Ezekiel and in Numbers. And there is also a, a book uh, that Bill Shea wrote uh, some years ago when he finds 21 reasons to use the year-day principle. I can, uh, if you have questions, I can sh uh, share with you how to get that book. So it's not something that we are making up, but it's something that was established by the reformers. Uh, the way that Jesus and the, and, and the prophets understood the scripture. If you go to Matthew 24, you're going to see the way that Jesus is explaining uh, prophecy also, using the same method of interpretation. So we said that Matthew 24 is to talk about the destruction of Jerusalem, then the period of great tribulation, and then in verse 29, let's read Matthew 24, Matthew 24, and then we're going to read verse 29. This is what the Bible says, immediately, after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. So what, uh, what Jesus is doing here, he's explaining uh, what, what Daniel had, right? He's, he's repeating some of the things that Daniel had and he's giving us new information. He's talking that uh, this tribulation, right? It's interesting. As I was reading last night, uh, and I, I can give you an assignment also today to read Great Controversy, page 306. There you're going to see about this dark day that it happened in this area here in New England. Remember, uh, it was in May 1780 when some of the historians say that uh, there was nothing since the time of Christ that lasted that long, right? That it was like nine in the morning and everything went dark and it lasted until midnight. And uh, the students of prophecy understood that we were living in interesting times the fulfilling of Bible prophecy. But then Jesus continues speaking in Matthew 24, and, and he talks, because what happened after all the signs in the heavens? Jesus talks that condition of the world is like Noah's day. Don't you see that? The condition of Noah's day, they were drinking, they were uh, married, being getting, given in marriage, and doing all these things, not that those things are bad in itself, but what, what is happening is that they are unaware of the times where they are living. They are continuing life as it's going to continue forever without understanding the times that they are. It's exactly what happened in Noah's day. In Noah's day, 
after the ark was closed, remember, that it was closed before it started to rain, people continue doing things as they have done after, until it started to rain, and then the flood took them all away. So Jesus says it is going to be the same as in the days of Noah. So why were people deceived? And why are people deceived? Well, in the time of the Dark Ages, the Middle Ages, the reason that the people were deceived is because the Bible was taken away. And because there was no scripture, people were in darkness. But God, right, uh, was working with his people. And he started raising uh, these reformers, Martin Luther, John Calvin, Swingley, and others, that um, went to Scripture. And, and they came up with these principles of interpretation that we as Seventh-day Adventists have adopted. They say a Scripture is the norm of faith and authority. How many of you believe that? They say the scripture is infallible revelation of promotional truth. And so people get worried when we use the word infallible. But friends, if a scripture is not infallible, then what is left for us? Is there anything that we can trust? We can trust in the word of God. So the reformer said there need to be scriptures give you clarity, but also when you study scripture, you need to pray because it is not you there alone, but, but God, the same way as he did with Daniel, he will send his angel to explain things to you. You know that God is so interested in, that we understand scripture, that when we pray, he will send us his angels to explain scripture to us. And they, they came with the idea, the reformer, that to interpret scripture, it was for everyone. That you don't need to come to your pastor and, 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 and expect that, that, uh, um, that he has the, all the right answers. But that God, the Holy Spirit, is with you when you study scripture. And, and that he can reveal things to you. Then what you do, if you find something, you, you get other people and study with them. That's why we always announce it, that, that we encourage to have a small groups in this church. Wouldn't that be wonderful? together in the week and pray together and open the scripture and ask God to, to give us clarity, to give us understanding. Also, the, the, one of the principles was that, that Bi Bible narratives are accurate history. This is important. That means that Genesis 1 to 11 is history. That's how it happened. And I think that, that it's important for us to understand because uh, early in, in church history, there was a, a church father named Origen who started this allegorizing of a scripture. And, and that's not the way that we study scripture. We study scripture because we know that, that the narratives creation story, that's how it happened. That is truth. And, and also the focus of the Bible needs to be about Christ. A scripture is its own interpreter. The necessity of the Holy Spirit. That's the heritage of the Reformation that we as Seventh-day Adventists adopted. So what's the heritage of the Reformation then? We say, historicism. We say that prophecies cover from the time of the prophet until the second coming, right? But the heritage of the Roman Catholic Church is preterism. You know what preterism is? Is that most of all the prophecies speak about the first advent. Most of the prophecies are about the first century. They don't, they don't have meaning for us, but it's is something that happened in the past. So when the Bible talks about the Antichrist, they say that that was Nero. 
Why would the Catholic Church do this? Because the reformers, when they, when they were studying the Bible, they came to the conclusion that the papacy was the man of sin. So they say, okay, how do we do this? Okay, we're going to divert the attention and we're going to come up with this system of interpretation, preterism, which is that everything happens, what? In the first century and it's about the first advent of Christ. But then they also came with uh, another system of interpretation, futurism. Futurism is that all prophecies are fulfilling the future. So if you're looking for the man of sin, Paul says that it was already in his day. But he said, no, 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 the man of sin is someone who's going to come in the future. And that's why you have movies about Left Behind and all of those things about the great tribulation that according to them, Jesus comes for his church. But then there is a second opportunity that he come for the Jews. So it's like God is giving people a second opportunity. If you don't make it this time, then it's going to be another opportunity. That's how Satan plays with us. Because he knows human nature and he knows that, that, that if, we, if we think there is another opportunity, then we will probably live our lives according to however we want to live then and then wait for that last opportunity. But the Bible is clear, right? That when Jesus comes, that there is a close observation. And there is also this other method of interpretation that it is idealism. Idealism is that that's a non-historical view of prophecy. So it's the Bible, it, we need to apply it to my life, whatever I'm going through today. But there is no historical view in that, in that way. If you follow preterism, futurism, or idealism, you will never find out the, who the remnant church or Bible prophecy is. You will never find who the Antichrist is. You will never find the battle of the great controversy that's playing in our world. We say historicism it starts with the, with the empires of, of, of Bible prophecy. prophecy. Remember? Babylon, you know this, Middle Persia, Greece, Rome. Then you have the little horn, Rome in the two faces, right? Pagan Rome and then Papal Rome. You see how, how easy it is then to understand what the Remnant Church is and how easy it is to understand who the Antichrist is. We also... Um, have a, after the cross, we have a Christ-centered view of prophecy. There is a literal to a spiritual meaning. For example, in, in the Old Testament, the people of God are, are Israel. Old Testament nation of Israel, right? That's a place in Palestine. In the New Testament, who is God's people? A spiritual Israel. That is not just in one place, right? But it's in all the world, spiritual Israel. Babylon, in the Old Testament, remember, it was the enemy of God's people. In the New Testament, Babylon, in the book of Revelation, is the spiritual Babylon, the enemy of God's people. The sanctuary, right? Sanctuary in the, uh, in the, in, in the Old Testament, we had the, this uh, structure, right? This temple. In the New Testament, the Bible tells us that, that this is, in, in, in chapter, Hebrews chapter 9, and verse 23. This is what Hebrews says. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in heavens should be purified with this, but the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifice than this. So what is, um, so in, in the, we have the literal sanctuary in, on earth, but now we have the sanctuary in heaven, the temple in heaven that John sees in the book of Revelation where God dwells. 
when Jesus is interceding for us in the real sanctuary, that the original, that, that God built and not man. And then, in the book of Revelation, in chapter 10, following the historical method of, of interpretation, right? We have the history of the disappointment. How these Christians were preaching about the coming of Christ. And how, how when, when Jesus didn't return, they went to Scripture. And, and when they were studying the Scripture, they understood that, that the, the sanctuary, the real one, was not in, on earth, as William Miller preached, but it was in heaven. And that gave birth to that remnant. And, and Revelation chapter 10 explains the disappointment of this remnant that was waiting for the second coming of Christ. But then Jesus didn't come. And then we are given who this remnant is, right? Keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus. So friends, this is us. This is, this is our church. We have been called with this special message for this special time. But as I mentioned at the beginning, it's not just theory. Because I'm sure that most of us understand these things and are established in present truth with that understanding, but it has to be an experience. It needs to be an experience because that what we are told is that we need to prophesy again. So we have an important message. These messages that are going to prepare a people for the soon coming of Christ. So as Seventh-day Adventists, we shouldn't be filled with pride because it is not about ourselves, but it is about Jesus who has given us this important message, this urgent message for this special time to prepare the world for the soon coming of Christ. So what is the denomination that was born out of a disappointment? According to Revelation 10, that's our church. So it's not an accident that you and I are here because God, God has given us an appointment and it is to preach the gospel to all the world and then and then Jesus will come. Can we identify this movement? Of course we can, right? The Bible is clear. When we follow the historicist method of interpretation, we find this movement. We also find who the Antichrist is. And we see this great controversy coming to an end. And it is such a wonderful thing to be alive during this time. So that we are just not observers, but we can participate in spreading the good news about Jesus. What do you say? Amen. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for Jesus, for calling each one of us with this special message. Father, we ask that it will be not just a theory for us, but it will be an experience that will transform our lives and that we will fall in love more and more with Jesus, that all that will see Jesus living in us. Father, help us to be faithful to you, to continue to do your work in this community, wherever we are, Father, so that Jesus will soon come and we will see him. Be with us, Father, because in ourselves we are not able to do this, but with Jesus, Lord, we are able to do all things. It is in his name that we pray. Amen.
Father, please be with us today. Give us a glimpse of the promised land so that our love for this world will lose value. Be with us, Lord, and help us to have the joy that only comes from staying connected with you. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you for watching our program today. If you have any questions, please call us at 781-438-2977. Again, that is 781-438-2977. We hope to see you soon in person here at our church on Saturdays for our 1045 a.m. worship service or for Monday night prayer time at 7 p.m. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen.